Our last speaker of the fifth session is Ruben Cantu. Ruben's coming all the way from Texas. He's a certified wildlife biologist and certified professional in rangeland management. He has 27 years with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as a wildlife biologist. Ruben's presentation will cover public ownership, North American model of conservation, public stewardship, the brewing of a perfect storm. Texas is 97% privately owned, but according to Ruben, has some of the healthiest wildlife habitat and deer herds in the country. How'd they do that? Ruben claims it's because Texas focuses their attention on those that are responsible for where deer live, landowners. We know that there is no better steward of the land, the habitat, and the wildlife resources than those who have an economic interest in that private property. Together with private landowners on private lands, we can and we are achieving successes in managing the publicly owned wildlife resources. New York State isn't Texas, but perhaps there is something to take away. Always remember this about deer. If you remember these two things, you can pretty much have a really good idea what you need to do as far as managing your deer herd. One, deer eat. They eat a lot and they breed and they can breed a lot. If you can remember those two very simple facets about deer, those two biological facts, you can understand deer management and what you have to do to, to help to make them prosper. Texas has a very successful private lands assistance program and the charge from the, our state agency's commission is to provide assistance to the state's landowners to help them steward the public's wildlife. This perfect storm, these components, uh, the deer is one of them, the North American model, state agencies as the stewards of the public resource, and the private landowners who are the real stewards of the public resource. All of that coming together, all of that uh, combining into this perfect storm. How many of y'all are familiar with the North American model? The North American model was something that was recognized. It was recognized by a German immigrant, a uh, professor now, Dr. Valerius Geist. Now the model has been uh, toted as a friend of mine, and I'll quote him. He says, the model is a hugely successful wildlife restoration phenomenon in North America. And he's right. From zero, well not really zero, but from very low numbers to very high numbers of a lot of game species and even non-game species, the model has been extremely successful. But when you read those seven pillars, those are the seven pillars, kind of hard to see in that slide that make up the model, you might notice that something is missing. Something, uh, something big is missing. You'll read about wildlife this, wildlife that. Uh, you'll hear mention about when people talk about the model, about fishermen, the hunters, the anglers, all have contributed to the success of the North American model. But where's mention of the habitat? Where is mention of the private landowner's role? in the North American model. Look real hard. Even though it's a hard slide to read, I, I think no matter how well you look, you're not gonna see it in there. In Texas, we use that term a lot, habitat. We know that we can't take that sim simple element out of the wildlife management equation, and we can't forget who manages it. Allow me to touch on this North American model just a bit more and its relevancy, or as some people may see, may think it's simple lack of relevancy in today's current society. First, let me say that I believe the model was born with more of a focus of the uh, public lands. And there I believe seems to arise some of the conflicts in the attitudes between some of the public land states and the private land states. It appears that the primary issues of concern fall under two of the model's tenets. The first one that you see, wildlife as your public trust resource, and the uh, underlying issues of privatization, which is something that was talked about earlier, and also commercialization of wildlife. And then the democracy of hunting and the issue of public access down there at the very bottom. But when the wildlife is occupying the land of a private landowner, doesn't it seem logical that for an agency to manage a resource for the public good, that it recognizes that it has to work in concert with the private landowner? Now this is a clincher. Whether it is recognized or not, the fact is this. Private landowners 
and the wildlife habitat they manage across North America is an integral part of the North American success story as far as wildlife conservation goes. By how private landowners choose to manage the habitat that they own, it is a private landowner that controls the fate of that wildlife that belongs to everybody. Seems to me that when we talk about the, uh, I'll just refer to it as a model. When we talk about the model, we talk a lot about it, a lot about the critters, the wildlife species, the hunters, the anglers. Who owns it? Who doesn't own it? Hunting opportunities. All those things mentioned as the seven sisters of conservation, all those things, those pills, those tenets, those pillars that made the North American model successful. Yet we seem to overlook the foundation that all of it rests on. Habitat. 63 to 73 percent of the United States is under private land ownership. Not so in the western states, but over most of the eastern half of the United States is under private land. In Texas, 96 percent of the state is in private land ownership. In New York, I believe you have about 63% of your state under private land ownership. In a Boone and Crockett publication I read recently, I read that almost 88% of the annual rainfall and snowfall each year takes place on private lands. How the private landowner manages the effectiveness, the effectiveness by his actions of each raindrop or each snowflake that falls on his property plays a huge role in water resources management. I think we all recognize that wildlife belongs to the people, but we also recognize that landowners have certain rights also. For over 100 years, wildlife management policies, policies in the United States have been based on the premise that wildlife belongs to all people, and the states with their regulatory authority should be the ones to address conservation and management. Now, during the same time, a strongly defined system of private property rights began to evolve. And to continue this discussion even further, we have to recognize who owns what resource and what are the rights of that owner that owns those resources. The wildlife resource of our country belongs to the people. That's not an argument. Most of the habitat on which the wildlife resources depends on belongs to the private landowner. And we can't argue that either. So there are inherent conflicts when one group owns a resource and someone else controls a gate. By providing and managing wildlife habitat for the people, the private landowner is essentially the steward of the public's resource. Thus, the non-landowning public should feel some obligation to help him carry the economic cost by allowing him to recoup those opportunity costs lost as a result of his stewardship of the public's resource. Now, controlling access to his property is a private landowner's right. That allows him or her to say who comes on and who, and who doesn't, just as you control access to your home. Not everybody's welcome. Some people are. If public access is denied by a private landowner, who the wildlife belongs to is a moot point when you think about it. If public access is denied by a private landowner, and again, this all goes back to the underlying issue of access. Some private landowners grant it for free, some grant it for a fee, and some don't grant access at all. It's their right. What I see as a bone of contention among a lot of folks is the term privatization and what it really means and how this conflicts with the first tenet of the model. Wildlife as a public trust resource belonging to all people. In Texas, private landowners have been leasing access rights to hunters since the early 1940s. Over 70 years ago, private landowners realized that wildlife has value today. If somebody gives you something for free, does it, how much value does it have? So these landowners have recognized that wildlife values often exceed the value of commercial livestock and sometimes the value of commercial agricultural products that they can produce on their lands. Texas's lease hunting system has allowed more ranchers to keep their lands and maintain more wildlife habitat than any other incentive you can name that we've got available for landowners in Texas. We also know that this system is market driven and current lease prices are what the market is willing to bear. It's economics. That's a tough balancing act, but let, let's ask ourselves a question. What's worse, a division among hunters uh, because some can access private lands and others can't, and now those that can are relegated to hunting public lands, or 
taking away an economic incentive and seeing more and more properties broken up for development, causing wildlife habitat to be cut up and paved over. An access fee allows landowners to stay on the land and manage wildlife habitat. Folks, a pat on the back, maybe a bottle of the landowner's favorite adult beverage, a heartfelt thank you uh, from a non-paying hunter. That's nice, real nice, but nice doesn't always pay the bills. I mentioned that some landowners chose, even in Texas, some landowners choose not to allow public access, paid or not. Can you tell me why you think landowners may not want to provide access onto their properties for the general public? Several years ago, a number of our field biologists across Texas posed this very question to wildlife, to, to private landowners. Do you allow unrestricted public use of your lands, and if not, why not? If those responding with a no, some of them really put that in big letters so we could see it very clearly. 33% indicated that liability fears kept them from allowing unrestricted public access. Another 27% said it was fear for their property and an overall lack of respect for the property and the land from public users. Landowners are also scared that casual visitors, those with no sentimental ties or those with no financial ties to the land, will abuse the land or the private or the landowner's private property. Now in the same survey, landowners were asked what it would take for them to grant public access. The number one answer with 56% was, it's on the slide, money. And some of them said, lots of money. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, that's your market economy at work. Landowners recognize an economic value in wildlife and that, that there are market driven incentives to provide good habitat for the wildlife resource. The public's wildlife resource in Texas is not in jeopardy, as private landowners have vested interest in managing for quality habitat and wildlife. A few years back, I looked at some desert mule deer population and harvest data from the public lands, primarily New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Southern California, and Texas. Uh, the results were somewhat eye-opening. In one in one instance, Texas had more bucks than one state's total deer herd. Despite the fact that the state's desert mule deer range and that state in Texas were approximately the same size. Texas had half as many hunters on the same amount of deer range. Two states indicated that they had more hunters than they had bucks running around on, on their, in their lands. Hunter success was about 41% in Texas and ranged from nine to 20% and the other southwestern states. The doe to buck ratio in Texas was 1.6, whereas in the public land states it ranged from five to eight, showing lots of hunting pressure on your buck segment. The average age of bucks harvested in Texas was four and a half, and in the public land states the majority was made up of two and a half year olds and yearlings. One state indicated that 60% of its yearling bucks were harvested annually. The estimated percent of the buck population harvested in Texas runs from anywhere from 10 to 12 percent and range from 40 to 60 percent in the public land states. I think I can safely say that because of the generally conservative nature of the private landowners in the Lone Star State, those landowners who control access onto their properties, who manage the habitat, that the management of the desert mule deer herd in Texas is in pretty good hands. That kind of versus what may be described as one of the earlier speakers said earlier, tragedy of the commons. Everybody's out to get all they can get while they have the opportunity to get it with no restrictions. What happened to fair chase? Now, I've, personally, I've got mixed emotions about high fences. They can be good things or they can be bad things. I look at high fences as nothing more than a tool. A tool, if used the right way, can provide exceptional benefit. Interestingly, many landowners have constructed high fences around their ranches to prevent deer from their neighbor's property, which in more times than not is overpopulated, from jumping a conventional fence and degrading their habitat as, as well. The driving force be, behind erecting a high fence is frustration. You have, a, you have a private landowner wanting to do everything he can possibly do. Out here, he might be managing his forest, selective thinning, maybe some block cutting. He's wanting to allow a lot of that regrowth 
as a result of those practices to get started. That way he can feed the deer that he's got within his property. Somebody said earlier, nature abhors a vacuum. Well, when you create a vacuum like that and you do that kind of habitat management, you're gonna suck in a lot of deer from other properties coming in. You do that repeatedly and you're gonna put up a high fence if you wanna see the good results because you cannot, you're getting frustrated with your neighbors not helping you with deer population control or, or doing similar habitat management practices so that some of the deer stay over on them instead of all coming onto you. So you put up a high fence. The question being, can you have fair chase hunting on property surrounded by a high fence, regardless of, that pro of whether that property is 100 acres in size, 1,000 acres in size, or 10,000 or more acres in size? On some of those larger areas, there's a lot of deer that never even see the fence. They've got lots of other country to cover. Just something to think about. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, our state's fish and game agency, has a very active and popular private lands assistance program. Uh, currently, they have about 8,200 parcels of private property covering just a hair under 30 million acres under written wildlife management plans. We have lots of biologists whose, whose primary focus is doing nothing but working with private landowners, helping those private landowners become better stewards of the public's resource. That's what their job is. That's what this whole program is all designed for. Uh, through collaborative partnerships with private landowners using broad-minded approaches, good science, and lots of persistence, wildlife managers can manage the public's resource via the private landowner on private lands for the betterment of the habitat for the use of the general public. I'm not here to push what we do onto you guys. The model we have is not perfect, but it also isn't broken. Uh, it does, however, fit our own traditions and needs, and it does recognize private landowners who manage habitat. These private landowners, these stewards, are an integral part of the conservation equation. We know that there's no better steward of the land, the habitat, and wildlife resources than those that have an economic interest in the property. Working together, private landowners, understanding the North American model, public lands, public resources, a collaborative effort with all folks with a vested interest in those resources, we can ensure that the public's wildlife resource has a home on both public and private lands. And with that, I will close with one final quote from Aldo Leopold. He says, conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. <laughs>